Hello, my name is Nicole Bernardo. I'm a planning program coordinator for the Washington State Emergency Management Division, and I'm going to help explain what a Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, or CEMP, is and how to format one. This will be the first video in a series that will explore the CEMP and how we at Washington Emergency Management Division review local jurisdiction plans. Together, we will explore what a CEMP is, the format for writing a plan, and a high-level review of the CEMP tiered checklist. In subsequent videos, we will break down the checklist by tiers to help you as you develop your own CEMPs. So let's get started. The term Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, or CEMP, is not defined in FEMA doctrine. It is not a single plan or document, but a management system. Comprehensive Emergency Management provides a policy-level framework to support emergency response activities across all five mission areas. So where did the term CEMP come from if it's not defined? In 1949, with the successful Soviet tests of a nuclear weapon, the National Security Resource Board outlined a set of civil defense functions coined the Blue Book and how they should be implemented by government. Congressional resistance to paying for a comprehensive program and concerns about establishing public dependency on government led to the adoption of a doctrine of self-help and individual responsibility for preparedness to minimize, not eliminate risk. Differing approaches to national defense between the next several presidential administrations led to slow moving progress in merging civil defense and emergency preparedness. While civil defense was getting much attention through the Cold War and Cuban Missile Crisis, an Office of Emergency Planning report from 1970 concluded that the nation's preparedness for natural disasters was minimal to non-existent. As a result, domestic policy changes were introduced, including National Security Decision Memorandum 184, which recommended a dual-use approach to federal citizen preparedness programs and the replacement of the Office of Civil Defense with the Defense Civil Preparedness Agency. For the first time in history of civil defense, federal funds previously allocated for the exclusive purpose of preparing for military attacks could be shared with state and local governments for natural disaster preparedness. In the 1970s, a series of natural disasters and their subsequent responses involving hundreds of federal agencies prompted governors through the National Governors Association to propose the consolidation of federal response to disasters into one agency. In addition, there was increased pressure to expand civil defense to include preparation and response to natural disasters. In response, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was created in 1979 to consolidate civil defense efforts in the United States. In 1994, the Federal Civil Defense Act of 1950 was repealed and all remnants of civil defense authority were transferred to Title VI of the Stafford Act. This completed the evolution of civil defense into an all-hazards approach to preparedness. FEMA now had the statutory responsibility for coordinating a comprehensive emergency preparedness system to deal with all types of disasters. A comprehensive emergency management program includes linkages across the five mission areas of prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. A comprehensive emergency management plan is a suite of multiple plans and a cycle of preparedness to ensure effective coordination before, during, and after incident response. Many CEMPs only address emergency management in the context of the response mission area, such as the use of the emergency operations plan as the CEMP. This type of plan addresses several operational response functions and describes how to fulfill its mission of providing resources for incident management However, it does not complete the full picture of comprehensive emergency management. For example, an emergency operations plan might not address the mitigation measures that could be taken to help decrease the impacts of a disaster, such as implementing building codes for earthquake-prone areas or taking the extra steps of sound land use planning for wildland fire mitigation. In order for your CEMP to be comprehensive, you should consider all mission areas, not just response. The National Preparedness Goal established by the Department of Homeland Security defines what it means for the whole of community to be prepared for all types of disasters and emergencies. This goal, established under Presidential Policy Directive 8, sets the vision for preparedness for the nation. 
planning efforts should use the National Preparedness Goal as a strategic measure in all preparedness activities. The definition of the National Preparedness Goal is a secure and resilient nation with the capabilities required across the whole community to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the threats and hazards that pose the greatest risk. So, with the National Preparedness Goal in mind, Washington State Emergency Management Division recommends the use of the Comprehensive Preparedness Guide, or CPG 101, as well as Washington Administrative Code 118-30-060 when formatting the CEMP. Local emergency operations plans should largely be consistent with state, regional, or tribal plans. Our tiered CEMP review checklist is the guide by which state planners at the Emergency Management Division review local jurisdictional plans. The checklist incorporates existing federal laws, Washington state laws, best practices, and grant requirements in a three-tiered system. Tier three is the lawful requirements. All CEMPs must contain the elements identified in this tier to be considered consistent with the state CEMP and be in compliance with federal and state laws governing emergency management. Tier two elements are broad in terms. They're meant to accommodate the flexibility of each jurisdiction to truly and realistically address these required elements based on available resources, organizational structure, and operational procedure. The CEMP will meet standards if the jurisdiction addresses a tailored approach to include the required elements. Tier two are state suggestions. While not required, the state suggests implementing these tier two elements as emergency management best practices to support a coordinated statewide emergency management effort. The Emergency Management Division review will not require Tier 2 elements. Tier 1 elements are optional pursuits meant to promote state-level engagement in jurisdictions' organizational goals. Some jurisdictions pursue national accreditation or certification, while others may desire a more robust evacuation plan. The Emergency Management Division review will not require Tier 1 elements. The intent behind this tiered approach is to ensure the lawful requirements emergency management organizations must provide their citizens are thoroughly identified, but tailored to each jurisdiction. Once those requirements are identified, the state wants to be more approachable in providing support to jurisdictions for improving their planning efforts while not increasing any type of mandatory burden on local resources. Finally, for those who possess the resources and desire to strive for some degree of accreditation, the state is here to provide support and guidance to jurisdictions to reach their individual goals. So now that we have identified how we at the Emergency Management Division review local jurisdictional CEMPs, let's delve into the components of a CEMP. In subsequent videos, we will further break down each tier of the review checklist, so keep an eye out for other videos. The CEMP consists of two parts. A basic plan describing the overall strategy of the emergency management organization and support annexes that outline the operational approach to emergency management. I'm now going to let Shane Moore, my planning teammate, explain the format for a CEMP and its support annexes. Hi, my name is Shane Moore and I'm a planner at the Washington State Emergency Management Division. I would like to discuss an especially important topic to me plan structure. When a plan has no structure, it can be like reading a novel that is out of order. Sure, everything may be there, but it cannot tell its story, and every plan has a story to tell. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes discussing the basic structure to use to outline and frame your plan based on CPG 101 and the WAC 11830. Now, some of you might be saying, structure is great, but what do I put into it? For that, I'll be outlining some general information that should be included. This general information is a combination of those important topics covered in CPG 101, the Continuity Guidance Circular, the National Planning Frameworks, RCW 3852, and WAC 11830. I like to think of this last part like a Vincent van Gogh paint-by-numbers painting, a beautiful painting that can be broken down into simple steps using techniques that many can follow and practice. We have assisted in drawing the outlines of color with structure, and assisted in content development by indicating which colors go where. Now let's get to work. 
The Basic Plan Structure The Basic Plan provides an overview of our jurisdiction's approach to emergency operations. It identifies emergency response policies, describes the response organization, and assigns tasks. Although the Basic Plan guides the development of the more operationally oriented annexes, its primary audience consists of the jurisdiction's senior officials, their staff, agency and department heads, and the community as appropriate and feasible. The following is the recommended structure for a basic plan to ensure consistency with laws and guidance. The introduction section states the mission of emergency management and the purpose for planning through the CMP. This section can also contain content related to purpose statements, mission statements, and the scope of the plan. The next section is concept of operations, or CONOPS. This portion of the plan discusses whole community engagement, establishes leadership's intent through the description of operational objectives such as incident stabilization, life safety, property protection, and environmental protection. And lastly, describes your use of NIMS EOC or ECC activation levels. This section should also discuss the, sh the three shared core capabilities, which are planning, operational coordination, and public information and warning. The next section is Direction, Control, and Coordination. This section discusses the horizontal and vertical integration of other planning efforts. Another way of saying this is how do your plans integrate with other departments or nearby jurisdictions? This is horizontal integration. Also, how does this plan integrate with city, county, state, and federal plans? This is vertical integration. Finally, this section should also discuss the 12 response core capabilities. Next is the organization section. This section discusses organizational chains of command and includes diagrams. Organizational structures should include both activation structures and non-activation structures. Take the opportunity to use charts and diagrams to display this information. Next is the responsibilities section. This section identifies common activities performed by generalized groups according to the areas of emergency management. For example, what are the responsibilities of elected officials for terrorism issues? Or what are the responsibilities of all departments during response operations? Keep in mind that the responsibilities section with the basic plan only discusses common and shared responsibilities, such as all departments or the whole committee. Save those incident-specific responsibilities for their appropriate annex. Next is the communication section. This section discusses the local communication strategy and the integration of the whole community, such as LEP, AFN, ADA, etc. This section should also discuss limited English proficiency LEP, requirements and reporting. For LEP, ensure that you are indicating your specific language requirements along with how your communication strategy effectively includes these population groups. Next is the administration section. This section identifies how essential records are maintained. It provides a description of the documentation process for an incident, and finally it describes the retention and or preservation of documentation. Next is the finance section. This section explains the different financial assistance programs available in a disaster. It describes the triggers for activation of those programs, and finally, it describes the local cost recovery process with expenditure documentation. Next is the logistics section. This section describes the methodology involved in resource procurement, the resource request process, and any known gaps in capability. Questions to answer in this section might be, do you use Web EOC for resource requests? Do you have limitations on what can and cannot be purchased for incidents or blue sky activities? Do you have known resource gaps that would automatically require a resource request? For example, a city that does not have the capabilities to do mass care operations would need to contact their county for assistance. The last section of the basic plan is the development and maintenance section. This section discusses the CMP review process from local to state. The planning process used to create and maintain this plan, the maintenance schedule, and finally the development of after action reports to improve on the CMP. The sections that have been outlined 
are of course not the only sections that you can include, but they are the most important. Now that we have your emergency management organization strategy outlined in the basic plan, it's time to move on to the operational portion of the plan. Remember now that the audience has changed for this portion, where before we were discussing how emergency management is conducted in general, now we will discuss how you are responding during an incident. Supporting Annex Structure While the basic plan provides broad, overarching information relevant to the CMP as a whole, these annexes focus on operational functions and clearly state who is responsible for carrying out specific activities. Additionally, these annexes describe the policies, processes, roles, and responsibilities that agencies and departments carry out before, during, and after any incident. An early and very important planning task is to identify the functions that are essential in performing a successful emergency operation response. These core functional areas become the subjects of the separate functional, ESF, or department focus annexes and are addressed within the responsibilities section of the annex. Supporting annexes to use a subset of the structure provided by the basic plan. Functional, ESF, and department focus annexes add specific information and direction to the CMP to provide a mechanism that allows for operations to be coordinated. Annex formatting or structuring should be based on the sections provided in the basic plan. The following is a recommended format structure for annexes based on the suggested formatting of a basic plan. An introduction section that states the purpose of the annex. This section should also introduce the core capabilities which the annex is concerned with. A policy section that lists and briefly describes what ordinances, laws, policies, and regulations support or dictate the annex's operations. A situation section that describes the specific concerns of a jurisdiction and what the annex's department should, should pay attention to with hazards and conditions. A concept of operations section that describes the goals or outcomes for the annex. It describes what the incident management process looks like by providing a sequence of operations from start to finish. This section should also in introduce the critical tasks which are used to achieve the core capabilities. A direction, control, and coordination section that provides information on how department and agency plans nest into the support annex horizontal integration, and how higher level plans are expected to layer on the support annex or vertical integration. An information collection analysis and a dissemination section that describes the critical or essential information needed, the source of the information, who uses the information, how the information is shared, the format for providing the information, and any specific times the information is needed. This section should include information on Information collection. This is the process of gathering essential elements of information, or EEIs. Information analysis. This is the process the information collected goes through to verify accuracy of the information and any details necessary to inform operations and decision making. Information dissemination. This is the process that the support annex takes to share the information once it has been verified and analyzed, such as the ESF shares the information with the operations section chief in the EOC, the PIO, and the situation unit in the planning section, if applicable. A responsibilities section that lists what specifically this annex does to accomplish its goals and operational objectives by describing the actions and activities taking place by individuals or multiple department agencies and or stakeholders. All responsibilities should be linked to core capabilities and critical tasks to link them to the preparedness system. A resource requirements section that lists and describes what equipment, resources, and trainings in the departments need to possess to accomplish its goals. A supporting references and guidance section that indicates what plans or procedures already exist to support the annex. Lastly, a terms and definitions section that lists what technical information was discussed that may need additional clarification 
do not include those listed in the basic plan. If technical terms are included in the basic plan, but only appear in a single support annex, then consider moving them to this section in the appropriate annex. That wraps up the outline of a CMP's structure for both the basic plan portion and its supporting annexes. This concludes the description of a comprehensive emergency management plan. Key takeaways to remember are that a CEMP is not just a response plan. It is a strategic level plan that links all of your planning and preparedness efforts across all five mission areas in a comprehensive management system. The structure of the CEMP is important to the flow and context of the plan. When creating, reworking, or reviewing your CEMP, the CEMP review checklist will help you create a plan that meets all the legal standards as well as align with emergency management best practices. Make sure you check out the next video in this series where we take a deeper look at the Tier 3 legal requirements for Washington State. Thank you for watching. I hope this planning tutorial helps you answer some of those questions surrounding the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. For additional planning resources, go to mil.wa.gov forward slash planning dash resources and happy planning.